Okay, I guess we are ready to start. So hello everybody. I'm very pleased to be here and more I'm happier that you are here because you are in my home city and I was actually born here. And I just wanted to ask how many of you read my blog post about the Prague tips because there are a lot of people saying that it's good. So I really like that. Okay, cool. So this session is about my story going through a kind of experience being a freelancer and then going into the enterprise. And so my name is Marek Sodak and uh, I am a web developer for about 12 years. Uh, I am a Drupal developer for about past seven years and 47 weeks, which is almost eight years, so that's a long time. I also do design research and user experience, everything around user experience. experience. I don't have really a title that I can say like user experience ninja or something like that. Uh, I'm also a founder of an inline manual, which is kind of like my startup, which focuses on documentation for end users. So if you want to check it out, come come over. And I also founded a little company, Drupal Shop, uh, back in London, where I used to live for about three years, which is called Atomic and Limited, and we are building websites using Drupal. So the story. Um, so me coming from a freelance world, well, I never really worked for a company only like in these past 12 years, that was just like one year together being employed. And uh, there was one day uh, I got a call from a recruiter and that recruiter just called me up and said, well, we, we, we are looking for someone in Switzerland uh, to, to build, to actually uh, hire someone that is Drupal uh, themer basically and doing Drupal front-end. And so they called me up and I was in a position where we were actually moving. Uh, I was here in Prague and we were moving to a new flat with a really nice terrace overlooking the, the whole place, the whole Prague. It was even nicer views than you have here in Corinthia. Uh, well, there. So I wasn't really sure if I want to go there. So I just said, well, whatever, what can you offer? And you know, like I was really being mean and I just said, okay, well, I need this conditions and that conditions. And I set the price really high. And uh, yeah, and then after like three days, they came back and I had another interview, which was quite nice. And they actually, after these three days, they called me back again. So just saying that we are in this position as a Drupal, Drupal people where it's really high demand, demand and you can really say anything that you want, your conditions. So my friends advised me like not to go there because it's a bank, it's a Swiss bank. And they always told me like, okay, run away or don't go there, it's a rigged structure. And I never experienced this uh, kind of enterprise, uh, you know, enterprise uh, area. So then I said to myself, okay, well, what, what will make me happy? And you, yeah, that would be like this, what I want to do, just these simple bits, and I was really specific what I want to do, and that was just theming. And you know, theming is quite easy in Drupal, so that was enough. And I, ha I asked for a high, sal high salary. And then, yeah, then accepted. I challenge accepted, and ju I just went there. So it took me uh, almost six months. I mean, the contract was just for three months there. The first three months, I was just exploring stuff. This, the other three months, when they extended it, uh, I was still exploring. I was understanding what's happening there. And the stuff you were working on was the support portal for about 100,000 employees there. And it was a self-help support portal with a knowledge base. So that basically means that the users should be uh, able to help themselves. And you know, if they have a problem, they should search as for a solution and yeah, find, without you know, picking up a phone and calling support, which is much more expensive. And it also integrates with other systems, proprietary systems, and big ones. So my first observations were exactly the same ones that my friends told me. So it, there's a rigid structure. You can completely forget about being agile in, in this environment, at least in my experience. And what was really interesting for me, being a freelancer and really switching jobs in between doing some contracts and, and stuff, uh, they, there were people that actually worked there like 15 years and you know they had these batches where they have their photo and they were really young there on the photo. I was like, no, that's not you. And it's like, okay, how long are you working here? Well, 15 years and, or since I was 14 or something like that. 
So that's, that's really interesting. And it says something about the culture. Um, and it's also not a place where the innovation happens, and I will uh, later explain why. Um, and mainly it is because the people, because they are, they are so long. I think if you are working somewhere for 15 years and you are almost on the, still on the same position, but you are just changing titles. So all of them on, on our level, well, not all of them, but most of them are kind of like SOCA directors, but they are still on the same level. They might be changing the, the roles of the jobs, but it's kind of, I would say, a lot of similar to what they were doing for the past 15 years. And uh, the culture there is kind of like, or like that they are trying to please the people about, like the managers, everyone to keep them happy so they don't really think about things. Uh, well, not that much. Uh, we had also these monthly release cycles, um, which sometimes because of these proprietary systems ended up being like half a year cycles or even more uh, because you know there were some dependencies and they didn't fulfill it. So we were waiting for them because we had some other feature and, and so on. Uh, it was also difficult to, uh, decide on something or designs of, uh, you know, get a sign off for uh, some features because the, the team itself, uh, the, the four key people or three key people were in, in three countries and there was another uh, uh, Indian guys who were doing testing. So it was all spread around the, around the world. And um, mainly the managers, what I found out is that they don't know really, uh, well, they thought that they know what the users needs, what are the users needs, and what you know, what what they can offer, and how to make it work, uh, or actually that's what they were saying, but they didn't, and there were no analytics, no research whatsoever, but they knew what what the user needs. Uh, then you know, everyone now is kind of making some nice names, so I made one on myself. It's a success-driven success metrics. Uh, based on percentage and it, in practice it's kind of like I had this one business analyst who came to me and it, that was after I did some research already and she knew that I'm doing some research and she asked me well I need to prove that this uh, we had there like a forum communities and uh, it wasn't it was fail basically because there were no people uh, they weren't answering helping each other uh, I guess it's also because it's in the bank and uh, she came to me and asked, well, I need to make this forum, the particular forum, a success. Can you give me some metrics uh, which will prove it? Because she saw, okay, there's another forum which has just, uh, let's say, two repli uh, replies, and another forum has like 20 replies. So, you know, obviously that was success. And she wanted it in percentage. So that would be like 200% or, yeah, or more success. And, but if you looked into the forum where, where, where like 20 replies, uh, you would found out that uh, let's say 18 replies of these were moderators. That's what they didn't see. Um, also, it, it wasn't really clear who, who is the like leader or in the project, so there's no, I mean, this is supposed to be the managers, but that wasn't the case. And um, everyone was even looking up to them, so they were waiting for the, for the actual direction or show them the di direction. And if I ask someone, sh uh, well, where is this project heading? They didn't know. They were just waiting from one release to another. Um, so after these six months, uh, I said to, my, to myself, well, the contract ends in three months. I haven't seen much progress uh, because I was doing just theming and then development and other, other things. And so I thought, well, I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to spend or basically waste more time here, uh, what should I do? I should try to change something, not be part of these uh, of this group where they are like 15 years there and they are just listening afterwards. So um, so thinking, should I stay or should I leave? Because I didn't really care if I lose the job because, you know, be Drupal developers have jobs everywhere. And uh, so my first attempt was that I was walking around the office and from time to time, I was just asking these people that were there so long, I was asking them, like, just discussing what are you doing and uh, how you are approaching things um, and what is your role in the project. And everyone was kind of happy because nobody asked them before, you know, and you, you have to talk to people. And I learned some, some interesting things. Uh, so I was trying to get to, to know people around. Uh, I was trying to bring ideas and innovation during the meetings. 
and to use my, use my previous experience. But um, it kind of failed because uh, it was over, always by the managers, whatever man managers uh, required or put in like the requirements. And um, so I didn't even get any real feedback from, from anyone. Just like, okay, this is a, ni a nice idea. So I was fr frustrated again, and it was like after three weeks or so. Uh, the second attempt, I thought, okay, well, it was the period where uh, there were holidays, so there was less pressure on, the, on our team, on the build team. And as I said, I was originally hired for, as a developer themer, themer primarily. And <coughs> they didn't want, or they didn't thought that I will be doing this kind of work, like research and stuff. And so I thought, okay, let's let's give it some structure. Let's let's do some kind of approach, something more more uh, yeah convenient. So I started a research, and I, I based it on a, uh, principles around UC UCD, which is the user centric design. Uh, how many of you know about user centric design? Okay, not that many. But I guess you will find out that you, that's something you are doing every day. But uh, this is the uh, definition. Um, basically, you are focusing on the user needs, wants, and limitations uh, while they are using your product. And so we are really trying to implement what, what these aspects in, in every process, every design process during when you are building the, the product. And then if you follow that, you should be able to design uh, you know, a product that will be uh, based on, the, or in, it will support the intended user's existing beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors, and so on. And this means that you will kind of build a user-friendly, usable, uh, usable product, which might later increase sales, reach business goals, in our case, lower the support goals. Uh, just briefly, uh, you can use these user perspectives, uh, which are needs and wants, goals, motivation, and triggers, optics, obstacles, and limitations during your research. Uh, I mean, you can see this kind of list. Uh, user perspectives can be long, and it not always will fit for your needs. So for example, geography and language won't fit for every project and stuff like that. So use your common sense. And you see it's not just that you have to uh, if, if it's called user-centric design, it doesn't mean that you really need to do everything that the user asks you. And there's a, uh, one Czech entrepreneur, or was, uh, Tomáš Baťa. I don't know if you, some of you might know him, or at least the logo. He's, he was a shoemaker, and this brand still exists. And he always said, our customer is our master. And I'm sure he didn't mean it exactly, or you know, like, uh, like it's written. So if everyone will come back and say, okay, I don't like, let's say, this color of the shoe, then they won't immediately create a whole collection of new shoes. And there's also this brilliant quote which says, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want to buy a quarter inch, hill, uh, inch hole. So for example, if you have a, uh, if you have a guy coming to the, to the shop and asking the salesman, uh, I need a drill, and uh, uh, the user, uh, the salesman will just give him a drill without any questions, then you know, the guy will just get the drill, go home, and probably make some holes, but he doesn't know, you know what the drill does. But if the salesman actually asked him like, okay, well, what do you need the drill for? And he would say, well, I need to put there like a, uh, the, uh, how it's called, let's say the nail or something, and then if he asks more and more, then he will find out that this guy doesn't need a, 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 a drill, but he needs a hole, actually. Uh, there are several disciplines. Again, it's just, this is just a, uh, uh, yeah, one of these, but you can put in anything you want or use anything you want. Uh, the process uh, is quite simple. You just do the research, then the concept, uh, which could be like wireframes, uh, design, you just create the prototypes, uh, like low fidelity uh, prototypes, and then you evaluate. Uh, that means like you test with the users, you uh, yeah, uh, whatever is convenient for the project. Uh, I would add to this uh, two other things, which is deploy and learn. And um, question, how many of you actually do something after you launch a website? Do you do any research afterwards how it's being used? 
okay, but not much. And I think I think that's kind of like a key thing for us, for like web designers and developers, because till now, if you if you have let's say some research, some or if you don't use research before. Uh, it's all your assumptions and your skills that you had before. And after you launch something, that, that is the point where you can start learning new things because that's something you implemented and something you believe that w would work. So if you are not doing this, try it once, even on a small thing, and you will see that you can, you can improve there. So I started a research and uh, I was questioning myself, okay, what to research? Uh, there was a nice talk from Eric Ries, actually, and he was asking this why, and if you weren't there, then look it up on the, on the web afterwards. Uh, but I started with this kind of micro approach because I knew, or I have seen that in the, in the company itself, uh, everyone was chipping in, everyone was kind of uh, developing their own ideas without, without any research, anything, just based on the assumption. And so I took just one thing, just simple thing, uh, or I wanted to pick one thing and analyze that. And I didn't have anything like, uh, you know, like you have Google Analytics because it's a bank, it's a closed bank. You can't have data, out, uh, data outside or, or host it somewhere else. So I choose that just the simple thing that we had and that was the access log, which is quite geeky, I would say. And that's something that, let's say, in Drupal, you can see in the reporting and these kind of like refers and stuff that's all coming from access logs. So I started with that. Um, and, um, you know, if I would go to, because of course there are some reportings uh, done by the reporting team, uh, but, uh, you know, asking them, it would just throw in more obstacles because they would be asking what do you want to research and yeah, that would be a strange exchange, I, I think. So I did uh, this, uh, I don't know if you can see it, I hope you can. Uh, this is just a basic um, you know, graph or a chart that shows uh, what I did actually is I took the whole access log and based on the path, uh, like you have the clean path, so let's say within Drupal you have node slash node ID. So I took this uh, and created a, a kind of like a tree so that's just uh, running through the one week of logs. I, d I did this and immediately we saw uh, which parts are being used of the website. They didn't have this before or something really in a basic shape. And um, then I did another one uh, which is like showing the user flow. This is like a den dendogram. It's using the D D3 library in JavaScript. And it was quite complex to write, but uh, you can see these, uh, the, the, uh, the brown uh, lines that are going around are actually that users are coming back all over and you can see the flow there. So this was quite helpful because this is as well interactive, so you can click on one, one path and it will show you where the users are going. And uh, I mean, they, they had really f a lot of fun when they saw this. Um, so, I chose to use the search as my uh, uh, item for researching because the, the search is kind of, kind of like the most valuable functionality of the self-help portal. So, so let's say if I'm looking for a, uh, for a solution, for a help, uh, the search needs to work. And uh, sometimes like uh, there was this discussion in previous session as well that we take as granted that the things will work out of the box or whatever we take, uh, let's say with Drupal is a good case and we were just discussing this, that let's say you have a module, calendar module and you install it, you just turn on the module and you take that this user interface is, is working because everyone is using it so you don't touch it at all. And that could be from a simple smallest things like a search box. How many of you actually like uh, you know, looked into the search, whether it's working for your users as it should. Yeah, just for you. Um, so we tend to be really lazy because we get something for free, which is there or it kind of works. Okay, so this is, this is the, uh, I hope it can be seen. Uh, this is the initial uh, search box that I was working on because I chose just this particular part uh, that was on the homepage and it was like in a one column. 
uh, in the bigger column. So you can see here, like there's a search and find title, there's a pretty face of, of a girl, corporate style. You have the search placeholder. There's even the, uh, how it's called, autocomplete. So when they are typing, you know, it, it gave them suggestions. And there's the search button in yeah, like magnifying glass. Um, so when doing such a research, you need to set your, well, these were my personal goals for me to keep you know, doing these things. And wh what I wanted to do is to show the team that uh, we don't know much about the user experience and we don't know really what the users are doing. Uh, and I also wanted to showcase some of the research approaches so they can you know, do it themselves and understand that there is something more behind. And as well, make the search to be used more often and make the user-centric design one of the processes, which is kind of like high-level uh, goal that will take probably 10 years from my experience now. Uh, and there needed to be an output. So the output would be an analysis of how the search works. And it should be delivered as a presentation because people there like presentations. And it needed to be sent out to all the members and most importantly as well managers so they can notice that. Oops, okay, that was a wrong key, sorry. Right, so the search analysis. So we wanted to increase the use of the self-help portal itself, which will immediately, it should at least decrease the race tickets so users actually find the right solution for their problem. And we assume that the search is not working based on the feedback that we got from the, the there's kind of like a rating on the portal so users can actually rate the service and they weren't very happy with the search. So that's the only kind of input we got from the users. And uh, the team itself already had a lot of improvements based on, on these assumptions. And one note about assumptions is that, uh, as I was saying about these managers, that they really wanted, or they really n always knew what the, re uh, what the user knows. It was all based just on their assumptions, which is not always the, the best thing if they don't have, especially if they don't, if they don't have the experience. Uh, so then I created a simple scenario. It's kind of like a user story. What would be the ideal simplified workflow for a really good uh, you know, user experience that they can search something? As simple as that, like find a search field, enter the search term, click the available action to search. Uh, if it's not found, then refine the search, read the solution, optionally perform some action like increase the uh, rating of the solution, and then exit. Uh, peacefully and tell everyone how happy they were with the service. So that was the goal. And obviously it wasn't like that. So I started with um, uh, kind of researching what users are searching for. And here you can see there's a blank keyword or link. Uh, the blank actually is a blank that they type in blank. The link keyword, nick, nick password, mind align, and so forth. And First of all, uh, you, s you see they're like blank. And what is blank? Why do they type in blank to search for some s something? So I had to ask about this, what is blank uh, keyword? Um, and why do users are searching for that? And it turned out it's a, it's a feature of the portal. Because if you click only on the icon, it would search for the blank keyword. And if there is a blank keyword, it would list all the solutions in, on the portal a bit of pagination, but there are like 10,000 uh, solutions. And then they can filter out because they have like filters on the, on the side. So this is kind of interesting approach that I haven't, I haven't seen before anywhere. Uh, so I wanted to prove whether the filters are actually being used. And you can see that I'm doing really just small steps, uh, researching just one functionality, step by step, just looking what it is doing. Uh, so <coughs> there are these URLs, addresses, uh, which you can, uh, from these, like, as I said, I was using the uh, access logs. Uh, and for me, it was easier to, to dig into the code. And I found out that, uh, for example, the first starting page is with filters undefined. And if they uh, used filters, they, there would be something in the content part. So it was easy to find out which ones were undefined and which were 
which ones were content or were holding content. So um, I was I really wanted to know how how people get to this actually blank page, and I was expecting that. Uh, uh, as it was implemented, I will get many referrals back, and that's just because they, you know, uh, click just the button, went there, and then they just filtered out. And again, I found out that uh, from home, it's like 1,100 uh, searches, let's say from uh, 5,000 searches, and from the search page, actually 510, referral 110, and so on, and then there were like a small part. And refer is like where, where where they were coming from to the search, to the actual search. So I thought, okay, home, why they are coming from home? I think that there, there must be some sort of like a problem. Why would they just, you know, click the search button? That's probably not working as it should. Uh, so probably the users were actually, you know, uh, used to just clicking the home. I think, uh, yeah. So that, that was kind of like the first problem. Uh, they shouldn't go there. They should, if they, you know, approach the website, they should start searching, and you shouldn't get to the blank page. Uh, search again. Um, why, if you searched for for a keyword, why would you, you know, remove the remove the keyword that you entered before and search again with the blank space? You, so that was another problem, and I found out that's actually an issue. Because if you if you in that implementation, if you type in let's say um, a keyword, you search for the first time, then you search for the second one, uh, second time from the search page again, it would automatically becomes default to blank. So there is a problem with that. So they weren't able to refine their search keyword. And then the referral, uh, which was pointing to the to the blank page, uh, it's yeah there was like a wrong link on the internet. So uh, if you remember, we were trying to find these, uh, whether the filters are working. And I found out that from these like 5,000 uh, searches, only 20 times it was used. And that's a pretty low number. So the conclusion from that was that the page, the blank page, the, the blank behavior wasn't really working as it, as it was designed. And uh, so you can see like from these little steps, we also find, we also found these, um, uh, the problems like the the bug with the search we found that the, from the home it shouldn't be like that and as well this intranet broken link and with this just a simple research you can achieve these these things that were always there but nobody re nobody reported them and another conclusion was that the basic search user experience seems frustrating because it didn't really uh, you know apply to this simple uh, workflow that I defined before and most importantly, after doing this research, uh, these are kind of not assumptions. You know, we, we have the numbers there. We have, we know the, uh, what, what actually the users are uh, searching for. It's not that we, we think, okay, we have, let's say, that number of hits for this solution, so people are probably searching that and that and that. So it, these are not assumptions. So I did one uh, created this presentation. I sent it to uh, send it to uh, team members and and managers, and there was some feedback, uh, but nothing happened. So uh, th that was kind of like interesting moment where uh, one of the colleagues came to me and she said, "Well, uh, we need to do something with that. We we know right now that's well." She said, "We know what the users are doing, uh, so let's do some change." Because she was already tired of you know being there 15 years and nothing changed, and she she went she saw like this sparkling that something might change and, and make something uh, usable and, and beautiful and you know something that will work actually for the user. So we uh, pushed the change below the radar, and that means that we didn't go through this whole rigid process where uh, we had to have like a you know design sign off of from four managers or three managers and going through all these kind of uh, calls and, and meetings, which would be another 50 hours or maybe more. And we delivered this, this thing. And of course, there was like uh, loads of blame on our head and a lot of problems and uh, because we, yeah, we didn't really go by the rules.
but I think that was the best thing I did in, in, in the bank so far. And uh, three weeks after, uh, I published a paper with all the learnings and findings, uh, which, was, uh, which I will go through. Uh, you don't have to read all the stuff there. It's just like a, kind of like a template if you like to take the slides afterwards. Uh, you can see how it was structured. Uh, so basically, uh, I created like this uh, what was before, so the initial version, and then the reasons why the search, why this research has been created, or you know why I started this research. So you can see as well the, the old uh, version. This is actually the new version, and you can see that uh, there I defined like the goals, and the goals were to increase the visibility of the search box to make it more prominent. That would fix the uh, that it's not being used that, that often. Uh, make user to type in more than just one word to get more relevant search results. And make user to type even sentences and questions. And this was achieved, like you can see this input type, which before there was just search. And afterwards was there like a ask a question or enter a search term here. And there was quite interesting uh, feedback from few people that they were, um, because this change took us about, uh, I think, two hours or so. And then people were asking a question, oh, it must have been really hard to make something that will talk our, our language and will understand our questions, right? And the only thing we did is that we asked the user to ask actually questions because all the solutions or most of the solutions always have something like, how do I do something? So giving the user the option, because they didn't realize that they can type in a uh, question, uh, they can type in like, how do I change something which gives more keywords, better results, so that improved Kylot with just a keyword, with just a copywriting there. And uh, we also changed the search button to, to be more prominent. And so I described all these all these changes in a document. Uh, I also put in like functionality development time effort, and I wanted to show them that it's really possible to do something in just like these micro researches or micro actions to to just push something a little bit farther and release more often than just one one uh, month release cycles. Uh, then of course follows the learning from the search box, uh, and then uh, again you need to know like what are your goals. So Search from homepage, it increased quite a lot. Uh, uh, there's the blue one is like the previous week, the week before the change, uh, the week after, and second week after. You can see that the second uh, week after is already quite <coughs> above the lines. Um, I don't even understand right now what was the formula because I see strange person there. Probably I got into this. Uh, success-driven metrics. And uh, so this is the search from homepage, uh, blank keywords only. We thought that it will decrease the, the number, but there wasn't a big change in that behavior, so it needs improving. And how do I search is that improved a little bit, so people were actually searching more the questions afterwards. Uh, and there as well, one of the goals was this single keywords and multiple keywords because users, users before were typing, let's say if they had a problem with Outlook, they would type in just Outlook. That wouldn't give them any results. So, or really broad results. So we are looking to make the users type in multiple keywords. And that improved a little bit, but again, we can do better. And uh, part of that was also the proposal to, for a new version of the box where we learn from these statistics, we learn from what can be improved and we put in some ideas. And, and then propose some sort of like a life cycle of the search box of the next release cycles because we needed or we wanted to make it fit uh, into this uh, design process that, that was there, this rigid one. And we didn't want to go below the radar because they wouldn't allow us and <coughs> back then, yeah, or still, I don't care if they, if they fire me, but the others, of course they do. So uh, then, this is the this is the life of the of the search box that we did. And what was really interesting is that, that um, I think I'll get to that. That right after we we pushed this this change uh, below the radar, uh, everyone was freaking out, like the managers, because they they really wanted to make it like a uh, you know like a 
success story. And they, they came to me and they never asked whether it's, it's failing or it's, is there a success. They just wanted to get the, the blue numbers. And it's kind of interesting that uh, why the innovation can't happen there because everyone expects you that you uh, will be always successful. And uh, anyways, the, the version 1.2 didn't saw the light or didn't see the light, uh, which is a little bit sad. Uh, but I'm working on another one because my contract is ending soon. And the, the conclusion is uh, that you shouldn't be afraid pushing things forward. And for example, uh, like in the bank, it's something different. And if, if you have people working for you know, a company that works there like 15 years, uh, they have their security there. Uh, but it was nice to see that these people as well kind of liked like they got into the you know new things and they they try to um, try to innovate or try to push ideas maybe a little too much uh, because they thought that we already have some sort of statistics loads of statistics but we only had these two charts and they thought we we have like a we know what the users are doing and it's really just what I showed you it's just like tip of the iceberg and where you have like the one ninth above and the rest is below. Uh, so if you, um, I would say you should start thinking now about your projects and uh, what, what can be improved there to, to make the users much more happier and as well like to, let's say, drive the business and think about what can be measured and define your goals, deploy it, learn it and make a report. And that means you, you or try to make it uh, that you can fail so you can fail fast and fail often. And from that, you can learn. It's not good, well, if you fail, uh, it's, it's fine, but if you fail on something that you failed before, that's not okay. So you should always kind of iterate and never repeat your fails again. That's why you learn. And I think that's, that's it for me. Um, any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question was if this was uh, if if doing this research was if my full time work during being uh, employed there. Uh, it wasn't. I was doing it in between of the build regular build work. So I was spending, let's say, like I don't know, one hour a day just you know analyzing the the logs and stuff. But it took it took some time. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Yep. Um, I'm working for a bit different structure and I'm working for Drupal shop. We have clients who pay us money, we build a website. And I really like this idea and the improvement that we can gain from this approach uh, can be really huge. But in this business, when we have fixed budgets, how we can approach these kind of clients? When we have smaller projects, it's not like 15 years, and it's not huge banks. How we can put this into the process? Maybe you have some experience on maybe smaller scale projects. <laughs> right, well, it depends on, on the um, what you are going to gain from that. I mean, it's easy to, to measure that for like e-commerce side, because you know, with e-commerce side, you always can measure your sales, even if it's a small project. So it depends, I, I would say it depends on the goals what you can set and what kind of benefit it will give you, whether it's a worth it or not. But it's always good. Um, they, you have to sell it as a, like, uh, doing the user research should be really part of the, of the web designing or at least some sort of testing. That's the problem. The thing is that we don't know end results at all. It's not something that is predictable, especially when you launch the website, right? You cannot say, that, okay, we launched this website, but in half a year we're going to do a research for one month. This will cost this amount of money, and we will increase some number of visitors or some other metrics for this amount. If we could say that, that will be the way go forward. But yeah. we fail. I mean, the aim of research and tries is to fail at right. some times. And we can fail five times, and on sixth attempt we will be way better. <laughs> but we don't know end results before we started. 
how we can go for them. Yep, I can. <coughs> That makes sense. No, not really. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I guess not. So thank you. And if you have any other questions, you can come directly to me. Or if you have even questions about Prague, I'd be happy to answer that. <laughs> Thanks.